the job controls you. You don't control the job anymore. And that's a dangerous process to be in because if something is controlling you, it can absolutely wreck your life. Which one of your businesses makes the most physical paper cash? The car washes. Good weekend, five, six thousand dollars. Do you see a difference between good debt and bad debt? Bad debt is when you go out and you use it to buy stuff that you don't need. But when you use debt to go out and acquire things that can make you more money, I think it's a good thing. All debt does is it takes you to the place you're already headed faster. And if you are on a trajectory towards bankruptcy, debt is just gonna get you there quicker. But if you are an upward bound and you're already doing what makes you money and you utilize debt, it is just going to increase your trajectory and your growth and it's just going to advance you further. Make sure you support the channel. Like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Brandon, in your experience, what are the weirdest business models that make the most amount of money? It, it, it would be hard for me to put my fingers on one thing. Like I like my car washes. Um, I, I've talked to a lot of people and they just don't understand how a car wash could ever make any money or a laundromat could ever make any money. Um, I, I like dog grooming. I know a couple people that are pulling mid six figures, uh, getting close to a million dollars a year off of uh, taking care of people's dogs. Um, it, it's just one of those things. If you just can find a need for, to fill for somebody else, it's, there's unlimited amounts of money. Brandon, one of the things that really fascinates me about your portfolio of businesses, if I've done my research right, is in a world where we're moving towards AI and tech and internet, you seem to have a portfolio of very traditional businesses, laundromats, car washes, physical businesses. Mm -hmm. Is that a strategic thing? I, I would think so. For me, it's, um, I hate to use the term passive income because I still spend some time in my businesses, but I feel like uh, with laundromats, car washes, vending machine, and, and my real estate portfolio, it's very much a time leveraged business. So I don't have to go and physically collect rent for my tenants every day, every month. I don't have to go to my laundromat or car wash and collect money every day. Um, there's, there's machines, they do a lot of the work for me, and then I'm reaping the benefits of setting up those processes and systems uh, to, to get money. And why don't you like using the phrase passive income? Because it requires at least a little bit of work. Um, I, I'm at a point in social media that I run into a lot of people and they say, oh, um, I'm just going to go out and buy one of these businesses and then um, I'm going to buy it and I'll, I'll never do any work. And I find that that's, I kind of get worried about that, that uh, setup because I, I, when I talk or I do coaching or I help somebody get a business, uh, no, you need to work for a while. And then you're going to be down to a point you're doing a couple hours a month or a couple hours a week. And then you're going to be making the money that way. Does that make sense? It does to me. Yeah. Um, I have a real estate portfolio as well. And it's passive income now, but it was very active income 17 years ago. Yes. And yes. Um, these Christmas number ones that are written, there's 20 or 30 years worth of touring and gigging to write a Christmas number one. But once that Christmas number one is written for 40 or 50 years, that's passive income. Yep. Yeah, I, I just I very much worry about some of the, the things that I see in the world out there. People saying, oh, you know, it's so easy to set up a, a real estate portfolio or a business. And then you're going to be getting checks in the mail every week, every month, every quarter. And I, I, I run into a lot of people and they think it's just easy. You don't do hardly any effort to it. And I try to remind people on a regular basis, there's work that you have to do. And sometimes managing a portfolio requires some time. But what's nice is I, I've, I've, I've done it this way when I've gone out and talked to people or coached them is that um, when I go out and coach people and train people, there's activities that I do dealing with my portfolio. I make five or $10,000 per hour of time spent, which is very advantageous. Why do you feel that there are a lot of people out there that are looking for the get rich quick? Because I would probably say seven or eight years ago, I saw a lot of those people. I don't personally see so much, so many of those people. So why are there so many of those people now? It's, um, they watch somebody on social media or TV. And when someone's doing the work, they're putting the effort in, it's very easy to miss that. Um, I've got a video I'm releasing here soon about this old train station that I purchased back in 2016, 20, maybe 27. Yeah, no, it's 2016. And I put 
many, many hours in the, revitalizing this old train station. I took videos of it. No one really wanted to see me put in new flooring. No one really wanted to see me fix the, the walls in the building. They're really interested in my process now when I go and, you know, I could showcase the amount of money that I'm bringing in from these businesses. But when it came down to the actual work that I put in, there just wasn't as much interest in it. So I, I talked to people about the work that goes into it. it they kind of roll their eyes at me. They're not nearly as interested. But then when they see the money or they see the nice finished project, it, it's really shiny and it really looks interesting. And that always worries me because I tell people there's a lot of effort that you have to put into it. There's a lot of hard work. It's worth every single moment you spend on it, but you're going to have to have a lot of motivation. You're going to have to be a, a, persistent, a persistent person that puts in the effort and is willing to do research. Uh, just all the process that it takes, I'm sure, as you know, to build the portfolio up. It's wonderful once you're there. But it, I run into people uh, way too often and they say, oh, this is just easy. I want to spend one hour. I'm going to get it done. <laughs> I've run into people that think that there's some magic button you can keep pressing to, uh, to make the money. And it's, it requires an effort, but it's, it's worth it every single time, though. So in your experience, let's assume that someone watching and listening is prepared to put in the work. Mm hmm. How do they go from very actively involved in building the business to more passively involved in systemizing it and collecting the money? Because you said you've achieved that, as have I. Um, so how do we take them on that journey? The, the big thing is, there's, I, I feel like you know, everybody has a God-given skill set. That's kind of like my thought process. And, and you've got a skill set that you're good at. And I've done these analysis of who I am or what I do. And um, it's like, okay, you're the creative visionary or whatever the term is for it. And it's about finding the right people or systems or processes to put into place in the business that I have. So somebody else is doing it. Right now, it's uh, uh, about time to take trash out at my car wash. So am I taking the trash out at my car wash? No, I am not. There is a 72-year-old man who loves going around and picking up trash at my car wash. Right now, we could almost turn the cameras on and he'll be out in the parking lot right now. And he is spraying down my car wash bays. And it, it's some, an activity that has to be done, but I'm not doing it. So we put it in a process of having him go in and going in and picking up trash. Um, going in and setting those policies or procedures up and then finding somebody potentially either is a person to manage it or software. We're in this wonderful world where software is becoming so easy to manipulate things like chat GPT, um, open AI, all, all, there's all these different things that can automate a process or a system. And if you can be the one to install those processes, then you can be the one to reap the rewards. There's so many traditional businesses that are out there that have almost no level of automation. No one's really taken a step back from those businesses and said, how can I uh, make more money doing this? I, I talked to a lot of wonderful skilled tradespeople, people that uh, are, are electricians, concrete workers, they build homes. And I've asked them questions with regards to um, how do you find new clients? And long story short, they go out and um, they physically talk to every single prospect. They don't... Um, they don't have any advertise any advertising or a process to get people um, online digitally with software, any, any sort of process to get clients and they do the advertising themselves. And I, I look at that and it blows my mind that they haven't found any way to automate the sales process. And as it stands now, they've uh, the, the ones that are taking businesses like in the contracting world, I run into people that have two and three million dollar contracting businesses if they would learn to automate those processes for finding new clients, they could go from a two or $3 million business to a 20 or $30 million business. And it's just through a trick of, you don't need to spend any more time. You need to just take a moment, push it away, automate that process. He identified very quickly in the owner's business process that one of their top employees was stealing money in between 60 and $100,000 per year. Immediately that employee's getting fired and it immediately improves the books from being in the red to in the black. So 
on the one extreme, you mentioned there are a lot of people that are looking for the get rich quick, want to work mm -hmm. one hour a week and expect the passive income. But it also mm -hmm. sounds like what you're saying on the other extreme is there's a lot of really hard working people who've built Absolutely. small businesses and they've trapped themselves in it. And yes. there must be something that's stopping them. They probably haven't read the e-myth, um, but even if they understand what systems and processes and hiring and outsourcing and automation is, they're still stuck in their business. So what's going on in yep. their head that they need to get over? It, 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 the problem that I see, and I could go to my car washes, I could go to my laundromat, I could go to my, my trailer park, I could go to uh, my, my real estate investments. Like we could compartmentalize their, the reason that I own them and not somebody else. And what I see time and time again with these businesses is they get so wrapped up in running the business as a job, they don't treat it like this, an investment. They treat it as a nine to five job uh, that they have to go out, they have to do the work, they have to pick up the trash, they have to fix the machines, they have to do the hands-on physical labor. Um, I look at my grandpa, he worked at a coal-fired power plant for over 40 years. Um, and it was over a hundred degrees Fahrenheit in that factory, that, uh, steam plant, uh, for the 40 years that he worked there. My grandpa had no problem doing the physical labor, but the problem is, um, it, it did not do him a lot of good to work 40 some years and not invest the, the, the earnings that he got wisely. And I'm not saying that everything that he put his money in was terrible. He had some real estate investments that grew a hundred times what he put in it. He had another larger portion of his money that he put in absolutely poorly performing investments. And I find that the, the, the work, the, um, the ability or desire to work is not the only key or not the only tool that you have to have. You also have to take some steps back once in a while and say, okay, I'm doing this thing. How do I do it better? How do I make more money doing it? How do I make it easier on me? Is there a way to outsource something? Is there a way for a piece of software? Is there anything that I can do to limit what I'm doing? And in some of these businesses that I've seen, it's as simple as a, a $20 piece of software. It's as simple as can we, you're sending someone to a job site to inspect something. Can we put a little uh, wireless camera? We've done, I put wireless cameras on everything. They're so cheap at this point. Can we do take this from something that physically has to be done? Can we automate it? If it can't be automated through a computer process, can we hire somebody that should be doing it rather than me, which my time, like I said earlier, there's things that I do that are worth five to $10,000 per hour. If it's in a, you know, if I'm spending active time in my real estate portfolio, my time is so valuable at this point because I spent effort in the past setting up the investment, making sure the management was automated, setting up the policy and policies and procedures so that I could get out of a job. Because the problem is when you're working a job, generally speaking, the job controls you. You don't control the job anymore. And that's a dangerous process to be in because if something is controlling you, it's the master of you, you're not the master of it it can absolutely wreck your life. And I've seen wonderful, wonderful people in my life and they've been absolutely devastated physically by the job that they've had. They spent all this time, their prime years working a job, doing something, and they don't really have anything to show for it later on. So, Brandon, you got laundromats, car washes, trailer parks, storage facilities, real estate, you mentioned dog grooming. There's a gun yes. to your head right now and I'm pointing it and you can only pick one of those types of businesses to be in for the rest of your life. Which one and why? Um, probably still real estate. I just absolutely love real estate and it's because of it's so big. Um, I, 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 I could tell you go to, I could tell you that based on the time that I spend, car washes are very, very profitable. Laundromats are decently profitable. But the thing is, on my way to go shoot video for YouTube today, I get a call from a real estate agent. Uh, he asks me, do you have any apartment complexes that you would part with? Yeah, I've got one apartment complex I'll give you the address for. He says, I've got an investor from California who wants a multifamily um, apartment in Southern Ohio, um, in your geographic region, how much do you want for it? And the, the, the first number that's going to come to my mind is three times what I, what I purchased it for. And I don't know too many businesses 
that you can go in with levered money. You can get a loan from a bank or some other way to finance it. You can go in, have that asset pay off your, your loan. After a while, you will own it free and clear, no debt on it. And then you can sell it for multiple times what you initially have in it. I, I like stocks and, and uh, to a lesser extent bonds. I'm not going to trash them ever, but it's hard to get that level of leverage um, with a low, relatively low interest rate and then wait 10 years on it and have it triple or quadruple in value. And I know for my real estate portfolio, it's not like this is the one hot pick that I have. Very few of my properties will I sell for less than three times what I have in them. I've got some that I'll sell for 10 times what I have in them. They're, you know, the situation's a little bit different, but it, it, it's very, very, I believe, easy or, or maybe, maybe that's the, the tough word. Maybe it's repeatable. It's repeatable in almost every market as far as I'm concerned. And I've got uh, several people that are friends of mine um, in, in um, the UK that are property investors. And they've they certify to me they are very, very strict in the fact that they, they love their real estate investments over there too. And I feel like uh, laundromats are a little harder to um, copy in England. Car washers may be a little bit easier. But with real estate, I know a lot of people that do extremely well. And so if I had a gun to my head, that's the one I'd pick. Right, so on the topic of real estate, there's something that a lot of Americans say that I disagree with. It actually pisses me off. Um, and I'd love your thoughts on it. And Robert Kiyosaki is one of the main people who says this. He says that your own home is a liability. Therefore, you should rent your own home, not buy it. Um, Let's discuss. What are your thoughts? I mean, I don't know too many investments that you can live in. Um, and I'm not saying that everybody should treat their home as an investment. It's kind of like a dual purpose thing. I'm not a big investor in a car because generally speaking, your average car will go down in value a little bit every year. Your average home, on a, your average home will go up in value every single year. And you get the benefit of living in the property. You get the benefit of having a house over your head. You get the benefit here in the United States of, of, uh, depre of some depreciable um, uh, value to it. You get to write the interest payments off your taxes. There's a lot of value in owning the home that you live in. Now, I run into some people, and I, I feel like maybe this is where the critical point is. They want to live a very extravagant lifestyle and it's not one that they can't afford through a home that they own. They want a nice big house. They want a vacation house. They want all these different kinds of things that affect them in their uh, home. In those situations, I can see a little bit of value in not owning it. But my home, um, uh, we, got, we talk about selling it. It'll sell for four times what I have in it. And I don't know why me getting a 400% return on my money is a bad thing, especially since when it was purchased, it was purchased with an FHA loan here in Ohio with 3.5% down. The down payment on that house, I'd have to check my math. I think there's about $4,000 in it. On the down payment, we've had the benefit of living there for, for many years now, and I will sell it for four times what is owed on the mortgage. And, and let, me, let me try and do the quick math. 300, it'll be about 300 times my down payment on it. And I, I, I very fail to see why that's a bad thing. What's your best negotiation tip for buying a business? I wanna know what the owner, current owner's biggest problems are. I can leverage that problem into a solution. And that solution will often involve me getting a discount. We are in disruptive financial times, interest rates going up, the banking system, the government, taxation. So I've created my Digital Financial Freedom Toolkit, a toolkit to help you save money in the right areas and scale and make money in the right areas. In the description and the comments below, you can find a link, go get it for free. Yeah, um, hallelujah. <laughs> I think you are the first American friend that I've spoken to that takes my view that it's better to own your home than rent it. I understand 
from the stricter sense that people would say that if you are paying a mortgage and your house is costing you money, it's a liability in a cash flow sense. But rent is also a liability in a cash flow sense, which people don't seem to say. But the thing with rent is, it's all dead money. Whereas repaying a loan, you are obviously repaying capital, you are gaining growth in, in the property. There are many tax breaks. I can't get my head around. I agree with you. And um, I, I, I think it's stupid. If you want to quote <laughs> me on that, I think it's stupid to say, number one, that there's a one size fit all um, excuse. If you're living in the state of California, I guess it could make sense. If, if you're stuck between a $2 million home, and maybe that's where Robert Kiyosaki lives. If you have a choice between a $2 million home and owning it and a um, house that you can rent for $4,000 a month, I realize that the debt service on a $2 million home is going to be uh, $14,000 per month and renting a four or $5,000 home will make more sense. But the thing is, if you would look in the United States, the average home is about $437,000. It is not $2 million. The average mortgage payment on that, I believe best based on last census date, it's $2,200 per month. The average home will also appreciate 3.5% in the United States. And if it was up to me and I could get a levered investment of with a $437,000 purchase price that's going to go up 3.5% per year average statistics back to 1935, I think is when the U.S. Census Bureau started tracking that data. Sounds like a really good investment to me. I mean, I'm just one guy, but that, that would be my take on it. Yeah, and, and if you said earlier that, you know, maybe people rent so they can afford a nicer property, but isn't that just a greater liability? A ho home yeah. you don't own that you're paying more rent on than you'd pay on a mortgage on a home you do own. Yeah, it's it. I think it's more of a materialistic mindset or 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 one where you're not wanting to set roots. I'm all about setting roots in a location. And it's not that you can't move every so often when you own a, a home. I've got a um, it's actually my wife's foster brother. Uh, he moves every two point five years. He buys a home. He lives in it. He invests in it. He fixes it up. Uh, in the United States, you can sell your primary residence after two and a half years of living there. He sells it tax-free yeah. up to, I think it's $500,000 right now. And so he has turned his primary residence into a investment every two and a half years that he sells off. And he started doing this, I believe 10 years ago, he started off with a $50,000 home. And the last home that I saw him was either in North South, North or South Carolina with a sales price, I believe, of between one and $1.5 million. So he's traded up over 10 years, it'd be four times at this point, um, the, with the two and a half year rule. And he's gone from a $50,000 house to a uh, one to $1.5 million place. Um, and we were in the middle of when I saw the picture of his last home he purchased. It was an estate with multiple, with a large parcel of land. So it could, with, with the appreciation we've seen in the last year, year and a half, it could be two million plus. So Andrew Tate said to me, you should not start or run a business that you're passionate about. You should run a business that makes money. What's your view on whether you should start a business in your passion? I, I feel like if your passion is is something that you can make money in, you're okay. I run into a lot, I've, my great, great story is I've got a lot of uh, people uh, in my life that love music and they want to start a music-based business. I am not a fan of that. Um, I, I look at it and I say, it, you are competing with 100 million other people that wanna do the same thing as you. I know you're passionate about it, but go out and do something that will make you money. But then I've got a 13-year-old daughter and her passion is animals and taking care of animals. We were at a uh, card shop this Saturday and I mentioned something, cause I have this example of people making mid six figures off of animals. I approached somebody at this card shop and said, would my daughter be able to take a position in your company when my 13 year old can drive a car, which is two and a half years from now here in Ohio, could she take a position in your company to help with animal care? And they, their response to me was absolutely. 
And then could your daughter or you come on as a marketing piece for us? So we're talking about an event two and a half years. My daughter's passionate about animals. So if my daughter can make $500,000 a year in a business that she can also be passionate about, I don't see a problem with that. The problem is I, I, that I feel a lot of people are passionate about one thing and it's going to be very, very hard for them to make money in. A lot of people are passionate about, uh, about football and whether it's European football or American football, there's people all over the world that are passionate about football. I hate to break it to people, but you are probably not going to make the cut for Manchester United or any of these other football teams. I'm sorry. I hate to break it to you. You're, you might be passionate about it, but you're not going to make any money doing it. And in those situations, you just kind of need to, to fess up and realize that you're never going to you're never going to be able to make money doing that thing that you wish you could do. Now, there's something that you could do to make money approximal to it. Maybe you could make a sports betting website or maybe you could make a statistic tracker or an app. Maybe you could do that. But if it's between something with a very high bar of entry, almost impossible bar of entry and something that you could do that makes you six figures in the next three years, or it can make you seven figures in the next five to 10 years, it would be way more competent. It would be a much better choice to do the thing that's gonna make you the, the money, and then you can go pursue that passion project in 10 years. Um, I, I think that that would be the better approach. I think it's a more competent approach, but I don't, I, I'm never really big on one size fits all responses because each person is going to be different and you can, I, I'm passionate about real estate. <laughs> I love looking at these houses. Now there is there is a danger of getting too passionate about a money pit. There's uh, you can be too passionate on a piece of property that's not a good fit. But I'm passionate about my car washes. I love learning about how the motors work. I love learning about how to take money, how the payment processing works. I like learning about the electronical systems in them. So I can I have found that I can be very passionate about making money and washing cars, and I make good money doing it. But I also feel like. I've proven to myself that I can make money doing it. That sort of sounds a bit like you've learned to be passionate about business. Mm -hmm. Cause you, when you said you're passionate about your car wash, you didn't say about the washing of the cars. The first thing you Correct. said was money. And I imagine yeah. if they didn't make any money, you'd sell them and you'd be able to start another business. I would, I would, yeah, I'd be, I'd be probably doing something else. So you're, you're correct there. Yeah. And, and that wasn't me trying to catch you out. That was me actually no. um, wanting to have this dialogue is um, business is a very exciting passion. Being an entrepreneur is something you can become very passionate about sales and marketing and recruitment and building a team. And I think a lot of people, they're trying to turn their hobby into their mm -hmm. profession, which I think maybe is where Andrew Tate is going. Just because you like chess doesn't mean you can start a business in it. But actually, yeah. you can become passionate about any business if it serves a need and makes money. Would you agree with yes. that? Yes, absolutely. Mm. What's your most brutal life lesson? I have walked into apartment complexes with dead bodies in them. Did they get done all of what they wish they could get done? And life's kind of short. You really need to be on your game. So which one of your businesses, uh, we've got laundromats, car washes, trailer parks, storage facilities, real estate. Which one makes the most physical paper cash? Cash cash. Uh, the, the, the car washes. We've gone to online payments for almost everything, but the, the car washes at this point, they do a good deal of cash sales. And what would be a good weekend of cash that you can get in your hands M me or one of my buddies um you I, oh me uh good weekend in cash five six thousand dollars and what's the most you've seen someone in these kind of businesses have cash 250 to three hundred thousand in a weekend uh that that case i think was a week so I don't know what it would have been for a weekend. Yeah. Let me put it this way. I've seen car wash owners. Um, I was mortified. He, they opened up a pay station and it's in very rural America, not a large metropolitan area, middle of nowhere. They opened up their payment system and the, the machine holds 20,000 20, notes. So 20,000 ones, five, tens and twenties. It was an expensive car wash, so a lot of them were $10 and $20 bills. 
20,000 capacity, it was three quarters of the way full. So there were 15,000 notes in the machine. And I was mortified because the machine was not very secure, very easy to rob. And I looked at him and I said, what on earth are you doing here? And he said, oh, I haven't checked it in a while. You haven't checked your machine in a while. And this was one of three, one of four payment machines at this car wash. And I said, you know, you left this. And he said, and the worst part of it was, it was an 18 year old kid. He had more or less inherited or been, he didn't inherit it. He was given the business by a family member to run. And it was his plaything. And whenever he felt like going out, buying a new car or whatever, he would go in the payment system and he would grab out a pile of cash and do whatever he wanted to with it. Um, it was very, very, very shocking to me because this was probably the first six months of me buying a car wash. Um, I bought the, these two car washes and then it, the floodgates opened and people were calling me about theirs, asking if I wanted to purchase them. And they just wanted, they wanted to show me what they were doing at their operation. And how much does a, a you know, a smallish start up car wash cost to buy? Uh, 100,000, 150,000. Yeah. And, and have you found going in there, there's quite weak systems, processes, and there's ways to increase efficiencies? Here in the United States, we have a lot of car washes that will not take credit cards or debit cards because the owner wants 100% of the cash to come or the 100% of the um, sales to come through cash because they want to be able to take their cut and not report it on their taxes. So they are more than happy to deal with the money coming in and going out if they can grab their share. Um, they don't see the upside on automating their payment systems. And that's, that's been a very odd thing. It's very similar in laundromats too. Um, there's a few other businesses that I've seen, but it's just not nearly as big as um, laundromats and car washes for cash sales and people who will not institute um, uh, cards and uh, card payment systems. So what's the rough time frame if you bought a laundromat or a car wash that you'd get your you know, return on your money? When would you be getting your money back and now you're all in the black? If you're not buying a, a leased premises, or if you're buying a leased premises, because if you're buying a location that includes the real estate, then the repayment period is going to be a decent bit larger because then you're paying the, the structure off, you're paying the land off. Uh, but I talked recently to the president of the Coin Laundry Association, and he said, as it stands today, the average laundromat in the United States is trading for 25% uh, cash on cash return. And he has the data from thousands of sales nationwide. So it should repay your initial investment off if it's pure cash within four years. If you go in with a loan, um, some sort of levered uh, purchase, then it can be less than a four year period. And do you prefer buying the real estate with the business? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm a real estate investor at heart. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people and they will very purposely go in, purchase a business They'll separate the real estate and they'll separate the um, the business and then they'll sell off the real estate portion um, just because they don't want to deal with it. Um, I was listening to uh, um, an economist or a business guy very recently, and he said that that's what one of, I think it was, M maybe it was MGM or it was some other large casino chain in Las Vegas. That's exactly what they did. They sold all of the real estate off to somebody else and they kept the actual businesses because they didn't want to be a landlord anymore. And I have talked to larger, um, Cody Sanchez is a big name in the social media sphere who owns laundromats and car washes along with me. And she just does not want to deal with the underlying real estate. For me, you know, I've got upwards of maybe a million dollars in real estate on these car washes and the laundromat, well over a million dollars if I include the laundromat. Um, but the car washes themselves are almost at a million dollars for just the real estate. And I look at it and I think to myself, here's an, another way for me to make money off this business. Um, I'm all about diversified income streams, especially if I can get diversified income from the one location. My car washes, we have car washes plus vending. My laundromats, um, we've got laundromats plus apartments, um, all on the same uh, parcel, all on the same property. Do you think that we're moving towards a cashless society and how do you feel about that? I, I think that most people are, I think most people are moving towards convenience, but I know a lot of people 
that are pushing back very hard on a pure cashless society from a business owner's perspective. I, I like the idea of cashless payments because they're very easy to deal with logistically. But I also like, I really enjoy, you know, what I can hold my hand. I really like having access to physical currency. And I see that, I think that I see and I feel like a lot of people are going to push back so hard on cashless, the cashless world, that you're going to see a world of pure, pure cashless. And you're going to be, see other people that have pushed back so pushed back so hard that you're going to see the return of hard currency. I know an incredible amount of people, very wealthy, very well educated, that they're transacting in hard currencies like gold and silver. Um, I don't do that because I want to keep my gold and silver. I'm a big fan of that too. But their, their level of pushback is so intense. I look at it. I, I have, I kid you not, I have been in real estate meetings where they have done transactions on real estate with um, hard currency, gold, silver, those kinds of things. Um, a little bit of cash sometimes, but definitely not a lot. Those those worlds do exist out there, and I cannot see in a million years they'll go cashless. So if we move to cashless, does that then open the door for central digital currencies? And also, if we move towards cashless, what about the millions of people at the lower end of the income who they need to budget with cash or they don't have a bank account or they don't have access to the internet. We take that for granted. A lot of people don't have that. Yeah, I, it, it is, it is, I think one of the most complicated conversations that you can have. Um, there's multiple States in the United States that says they will never allow the state to go pure cashless. Uh, I think, Ohio, I think Ohio has currently a pending bill that they will always accept cash or a form of currency, the state of, of, of physical currency, the state of Utah has now said that um, they they want to be able to transact in Bitcoin, several of the major alt alternative cryptos, gold and silver for repayment of debts that are that are publicly generated. So property taxes, um, other government fees that might be associated with that, they want to be able to transact in non centralized currencies, at least controlled by the federal government, which I think is a very interesting thing. Um, there's been a lot of pushback on the, uh, we, we term them the underbanked in the United States, people that just don't want to participate in the, the world of large banks or even small banks. And I've seen, um, oddly enough, and I'm not a huge fan of New York City, um, but New York City has gone and for laundromats specifically, they have mandated that all laundromats are required to take cash payments. They will not allow any new laundromats to go pure cashless. They're also, from what I understand, working towards locations like grocery stores, uh, maybe small health clinics. They're mandating those, um, those kinds of organizations to always have a way to pay in cash so that the underbanked and people with bank accounts can access their, their services. I guess maybe you term them vital services. Hmm. So Dave Ramsey says that all debt is dumb. Is that a dumb thing to say, Brandon? No, I don't think it's, I respect the heck out of Dave Ramsey. I respect, I respect that statement that he made because it applies to a lot of people that are slaves to credit card debt. And hopefully my parents never watch this because my parents were one of them. Anytime that there was a bump in the road, they would pay something with a credit card. My dad was a truck driver. He had um, situations back in 1997, 1998, where he was putting different things with his trucking company on credit cards. And it was a terrible choice. It was terrible debt for him to take on at 22.99% interest here, which I can't believe my parents ever paid a debt at over 22% interest, but they did. And it was a terrible thing for them to take on that level of debt. My dad thought it was a business debt. So it was, it was, it was a good idea, but they had access to credit and they spent it very foolishly. I feel like Dave Ramsey's uh, um, comments and content are mostly driven for the lowest common denominator, your average person, your average person who 
is more than content to go out and buy an expensive card, uh, expensive car, pay zero down on the car. Um, they're fine with going to the store and buying whatever the trendy clothes are. They're wanting to uh, access a level of lifestyle that they don't, they can't support with their finances. So I think that when your average person looks at debt of, oh, what can, what kind of clothes can it put me in? What kind of car it puts me in? That's, that's true. Uh, I don't like the consumerist mindset. I don't like buying things that don't have much of a value to them. But then I also look at the other side where if you treated all forms of debt in a way that they should always be avoided, no one would ever own real estate. No one would ever own a business. No one would ever, um, it would be almost impossible to transact in a business without a loan. And there's a case where it's my prime example. There's a very, very multi, there's a well-known multi-billion dollar firm in the United States where the owner is a huge fan of Dave Ramsey. He might even be a personal friend. I'm not going to say who the company is, but uh, they absolutely follow the Dave Ramsey mindset. The, the, corp, the company, they run a manufacturing firm here, here in the United States. They do not use any debt whatsoever. They make wonderful products that could, that have the potential to sell tens of billions of dollars but they are selling between half half a billion and maybe $1 billion in sales. And it's because they will not use any level of debt to buy machines to make more money. They're, they're manufacturing. They won't pay for tooling unless they've got two or three times the amount of money that they need in their bank. So what happens is this specific business is stuck in a cycle of selling the products they make to competing manufacturing firms with a license and I'm not opposed to licenses, but they, they make wonderful products and they are stuck licensing their ideas to competitors because they can't scale their growth because they refuse to use any level of debt. I look at them and I say to myself, I would love to buy these products if I could get them. They're, they're in such demand that they sell licenses off to competitors that oftentimes make inferior products but they won't use debt. And I feel like a, a competent business owner would look at $10 billion, $20 billion worth of sales they could do every year. And if it would just take a couple billion dollars worth of debt that they could repay over the lifespan of the tooling, it, it, would, it seems like a dumb decision to me. And I, I think that that's the dangerous side of the coin when you follow Dave Ramsey's advice without putting any level of thought into it. I think it's very, very, very concerning, almost dangerous. Do you see a difference between good debt and bad debt? Yeah, good debt's when it, good or bad debt is when you go out and you use it to buy stuff that you don't need you and need. But when you use debt to go out and acquire things that can make you more money, um, I think it's a good thing. For me, you know, the thing that I've said more than once is, all debt does is it takes you to the place you're already headed faster. And if you are on a trajectory towards bankruptcy, debt is just going to get you there quicker. But if you are an upward bound and you're already doing what makes you money and you utilize debt, it is just going to increase your trajectory and your growth. And it's just going to advance you further. What's your best negotiation tip? for buying a business, ideally at a discount? Uh, generally speaking, I wanna know what the owner, current owner's biggest problems are. If I can quickly identify what their problem is, I can leverage that problem into a solution. And that solution will often involve me getting a discount. And it doesn't always have to come on the surface of, I want this thing for 50% of what it's worth. It doesn't always have to come at the disc that at the discount of I need this thing immediately for uh, 70% of what it's worth. Um, oftentimes you can arrange negotiation tactics with them. If you know where their, 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 uh, their problem point is, I'll take it. For instance, um, we just had one of the guys that I help. He's in, um, the Midwest here too. He just acquired two laundromats with the real estate, um, with $0 out of pocket. And, um, we talk to people and they want everything for nothing. And this is truly a, he got something for nothing case. And 
he identified very quickly in the owner's business process that one of their top employees was stealing money. He did not tell the seller it, but he very quickly identified in his due diligence that a employee in the company is stealing between 600, sorry, 60 and a hundred thousand dollars per year. So when it came down to it, he identified this, the owner's huge problem in this, the operation of these laundromats, employee theft. And he proposed an offer to them where I'm going to pay you over what this business is worth under two stipulations. Stipulation one, you finance this business for, or this business with the real estate for 20 years. Stipulation number two is I want it at um, 0% interest with 0% down. The seller looked at this, this laundromat business with the real estate. He's on the surface, he's getting a, a significant discount on it, or he's getting a, significantly over what he's asking for it. And he took the deal. My guy looks at it and he realizes that immediately that employee is getting fired. And it immediately improves the books from being in the red to in the black. He had the guy dead to rights. It's a, it's a um, young man and his girlfriend are going in every night and stealing from the laundromat. And he picked it up on the cameras. And uh, that's a really crazy example. But I find that many businesses have these, these critical failings in them. Once again, when you work in the business and not on the business, you don't take that step back and stop treating it like a job and more like a business and an investment. Those kinds of problems, you end up getting blind to them. And somebody can be stealing you, in this case, stealing from you every single day and you miss it. So when you can identify those point pain points, you can get what you want. And it's not that you can't get a, a good price on the surface because if someone has to sell something today, and you structure the deal. I'll buy this business today for X amount of dollars. You can very much go out and get an immediate discount on it because you've put yourself in the driver's seat. You've put yourself in a position where you can take it over immediately. And what are the most common pains or problems that business owners are experiencing that you can use as negotiation leverage? Um, usually I'll sit down with them and we'll critically go over the books. We will look at their financial position and when you understand how the business works, you can very often start showing them that they're not making near as much money as they think they are or how much money they told you. I've run into, looked at a car wash uh, this week. The owner says, I'm making $200,000 a year on this car wash. And we looked at him and he's basing the remainder of 2023 sales on the performance from January to, um, end of May, I think it was. And we assessed how was the weather for your location? How was your utilization of it? How much were you paying employees? And you find out that the owner of the location was doing more work than they should have. And the weather in their specific part of the United States was almost anomalous, very, very good weather. So based on standard, standard math, it will not make as much money as they believe it is, especially when the owner's working 40 hours a week on it. Um, which as an owner of a car wash, you should not be working 40 hours a week. So then when you go and you look at it, how much is it going to cost to hire a manager? How, what's it going to look like revenue wise for the next six months of the year? What's it going to look revenue wise one, three, five years down the road? The business does not make near as much money as they, as they thought it would, or they expect it to. So when you can go in and show that owner that what they're telling you is not true, then they've got a moment where they've got to realize that um, if any other competent investor is going to buy the location, they're going to run into the same due diligence problems. The difference is three months down the road when the weather's um, statistically much worse, those um, problems during due diligence are actually going to compound. So then in that specific case, you can go in and get a better discount um, immediately rather than letting them go down the line. But then sometimes there's, there, it, it can be advantageous to wait a little bit and make sure that you are, um, you've got a competent handle on that business. And once again, um, the big thing is identifying those pain points in the business. What to you makes a business investable? Like maybe the top three things. Um, I, I want to see that there's a good track record of some level of either growth or stable sales. Um, with car washes, 2020 was a very bad year. Due to 2021 was a good year, 
because um, of a lot of people going out buying new vehicles. So we had a terrible year 2022, uh, sorry, 2020, great year 2021. 2022 was an average year. 2023 looks to be a little bit above average. But I want to see what does their sale, what do their sales look like in the three years prior to coronavirus, if I can access them. So I want to see, is there stable, is there stable um, sales growth? If there's not, and they're they're on a decline, then I need to look at immediately how can I fix that. Um, number two, which kind of has to do with number one, I want to look at how they're marketing. That's one of those automation points. A lot of people do not automate things. You should have an automated system of advertising. I'm very big on social media marketing. You know, I do the YouTube thing, but I'm very big on like community-based advertising with Facebook and Instagram. I look, do they have a social media presence? Do they spend any money on digital advertising? Do they do anything to bring in their customers? If there's a very easy play to advertise the business, then I'm going to be much more interested in it. Um, we've got on our car wash, there's certain advertising campaigns that we have that have a 100 X on, um, ad spend for every dollar that I spend on my car wash in certain uh, ad segments, I get a hundred times return on that. Um, one of those things is we give out free car washes. We also do it with our laundromat. Um, we give out free products every so often, and then we create social media campaigns to give away free products. And my return on the ad spend is just unbelievable. So I look at how easy is it going to be to advertise that business? Are there any hurdles with advertising it? There are certain businesses in the United States that have very strong restrictions on advertising. Let, for instance, um, marketing securities, marketing stocks, marketing investments. That's one of those things where if you're in that world, there's a lot of stipulations on what you can and cannot say either publicly or privately. Um, if you are in the pharmaceutical sphere, you can... There's certain things you can do for advertising and certain things that will end up in major fines. Um, there's even some things you can and can't do in real estate. Now, real estate, you can do 95% of whatever you want to with marketing. But there are some different market segments that you've got to be very careful on with advertising. And then the third thing that I want to look at is, um, is there a clear path to grow it, grow the business while you walk away from it and make it... Um, make it a much less active involvement. Can I outsource this to somebody? Is there good talent that I can bring in when necessary? If there's something I can't automate through software, can I bring in talent for not a lot of money? And there's a, just a lot of businesses out there where you can build um, eight your talent pool and outsource the management for pennies. My self-storage facility, I hardly do any content on it because there's no reason to. It, I get I get a check or I get multiple checks every single month. My manager upstairs and my 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 uh, facility I'm in, she gives me a binder of checks because um, I like I like holding the checks in my hand. And she says, "Here's here's the checks this month for your self storage facility. Go cash them." And I don't do any work on my storage facility. She spends one or two hours per month managing managing the storage facility. So in my self-storage facility, we looked at how it was working prior and we looked and realized there was a lot of ways to automate everything and take a step back. So prior to that day, I had, you know, prior to the day of me getting self-storage, didn't do anything about it. But when we analyzed it, we determined very quickly that it's a very easy business to step away from. So that's what we did. We implemented a manager and, you know, just between you and me and the internet, I pay my manager $20 an hour to manage the storage lockers. She spends two hours a month. So I get away with my facility for $40 worth of management. <laughs> so is there a particularly undervalued or underrated business or asset class right now that you think's, uh, you know, a good thing? Um, I'm always a little afraid to say anything on social media because it seems like every time I say Oh man, there's a lot of opportunity in vending machines. Everybody goes after them. I'm seeing with um, like right now, I, I I'm seeing some softness in self storage. I had I've had two deals in the past week get emailed to me, and a year ago you would have never seen a self storage facility selling for fifteen percent cash or fifteen percent um, return gross return on investment. So this one facility I looked at this morning, uh, they were asking $1.25 million for it. Um, 
av the average yearly income is in the $250,000 range. Um, a year and a half ago, I would have never seen a deal come across my desk that would have been better than an eight to 9% gross rate of return. Um, that excludes, that's not at net operating income, but that's just gross numbers because it's easy to calculate before you figure in uh, property taxes, which are usually the number one expense you have with self-storage facility. So I'm seeing some softness in self-storage. Um, I feel like real estate will always be something that you can do. You do need to be competent in the market you, you're in. Every market is local. Um, there's never one size fits all for real estate. Um, and it's just anything I feel like that, um, might be a playground for the wealthy. I want to look at or look at, um, getting into in the realm of potentially having a recession. I know that's a really complicated statement there, but my example here is I recently took out an ad saying, I want to buy estates. And what I mean is I want to write one check for everything you own, meaning your house, your real estate, your vehicles, your coins, your, um, antiques. I want to write you one check. And, um, I was shocked at the response that I got. And it's from people that I would not have expected wanting to just exit everything they have. And these are from older people just wanting to leave where they're located and move somewhere else. And we're talking about buying everything somebody owns for about 70 cents on the dollar. So I can go get my financial backing however I need to. And these are usually multi-million dollar estates. So we could, we could do a syndication on them and I'm objectively valuing everything in somebody's life and then writing them a cash off cash offer for 70% of what it's worth. So real estate, vehicles, antiques, coins, whatever. Um, I'm seeing some major softness in that market too. It's not something that I talk about very often in public, but I figured, hey, you're a cool guy. I'll say that. Um, so um, that's something I'm seeing softness in because what's happened is in the past, because I've been, I, I got my real estate license before the last mortgage crisis, the one that we had in 2007, 2008, when it started getting rolling. And the thing that I noticed back then that I wish that I had wished that I was in a position to do then that I am now is um, people start getting rid of during a potential recession. They start getting rid of um, real estate. They start getting rid of cars. They start getting rid of coins. They get rid of everything that has a value to it because they're worried that it's going to underperform. And in the end, it, it if you have something and you've bought it at a proper price, it doesn't underperform perform it gets it's might run stable for a while but it won't underperform as long as you get a discount on it yeah in to add to that brandon in the banking crisis so many bankers were selling their rolexes and their watches and i was buying rolex daytonas back then for five thousand it's hard to buy them now for twenty five thousand. so yeah we always do a quick fire round to end the show. Are okay. you are you game for playing? Sure. Great. So would you rather take now one million in cash or one million of engaged fan followers on your social media of choice and why? Uh, I would take the engaged followers because I can make more than one dollar per person. <laughs> I could, I could, I could make way more than one dollar per person. Can money buy happiness? No, but it can buy security and sta stability. And oftentimes, security and stability is very much like happiness. Do you prefer Grant Cardone or Jordan Belfort, and why? Uh oh, gosh, that's terrible. Um. <laughs> Cardone because he has a jet. He still has the jet, right? <laughs> What's the biggest mistake you believe you've ever made? Oh, um, not learning to do uh, proper accounting math when, at a young age. 
I grew up as a um, uh, algebra failure, could not do math very well. And um, I ran a business when I was 15 years old that was capable of making probably millions of dollars. And if it, I under if I had understood how to do proper accounting, I would have had a much better shot of making a lot of money at 15, 16 years old when my family was ab, ab, in a abject poverty. But because I didn't understand math, I couldn't get it done. What's your biggest regret? Um, I don't know. It, it would probably be not, I, I guess not, it's kind of a mixture of not believing in myself and not asking for things. I've for years and years and years, I felt incapable of giving other people a lot of value. And this specifically in the real estate world, but I feel like it's probably more than that. Um, I was on the front seat, like I said earlier, in the crisis, the mortgage crisis of 2006, you know, 2007, 2008, and so on. And I, as a real estate agent, um, was seeing apartment complexes and houses sell for nothing. Um, apartment complexes that are now worth half a million dollars sell for 25 grand back during the crisis. And I could see this tidal wave that was destroying property prices, but the, the real value, the true value of those apartment complexes wasn't really shaken. And I just felt like I'm, I've been in real estate for two or three years. I, I'm, you know, I'm not good at math. I'm not good at any of these things. No one will give me money. No one will listen to me that this is a temporary thing and we should go out and buy some apartment complexes. It took me from 2007 to 2013 to say, you know what? I'm not an idiot. I, I can go out and write a business plan. I can go out and solicit investments. And it was like a light bulb just turning on. And I asked for pe people for money and they said, well, you know, the first group of people that I asked investment money from, they said, how much do you need? I thought, I never in a million years would have thought this would have, that, that would be the response I got. How much money do you need? Not you're stupid. This will never work. Why are you asking me this? It was how much do you need and how quick do you need it? And now I'm at a point where I have touched, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars from um, investors and lenders and non-bank partners. And I look at it and I think if, if I would have had that same mindset back in 2006, 2007, I would have an asset pool in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And maybe you'd be asking somebody else, who do you prefer, you know, Brandon from Investment Joy or Cardone? <laughs> it's possible, but I didn't have the ability to go out and ask those questions. What's your most brutal life lesson? Oh, how brutal do you want? And can we monetize your, the stream? Your most brutal lesson. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I, I guess it's to an extent, you know, life's kind of short. Um, you really need to be on your game. Um, I've got a lot of people in my family that have died young. I've seen a lot of my tenants die young. Um, I have walked into apartment complexes with dead bodies in them, people have, that have died. And it's incredible to see um, all of somebody's life end. And you get the, it's, it, you see somebody's life end and you're at a point, well, did they get done all of what they wish they could get done? And the family's there, they're wishing they could have done more. I'm pretty sure the person died with having a lot of regrets. So the, the brutality part there is, you know, even for me, am I on my A game? Am I doing all that I can do? Am I going to live a life of regrets? Will I end up 20 years down the road saying, should I have taken more risks? Should I have spent more time with my family? Should I, what are the regrets that I have? And even though we, we, we talk about the, the regrets that I've had, um, I feel like they're going to be some regrets, but they're not going to be brutal because my life's not over. And the problem is there are people out there that don't have a lot longer to live and they're, it's not even on their radar at this point. They, they, it's not even a concern in their mind and it will be a concern soon it will be a extreme concern for their families what one thing about life are you a most excited about and b most scared of um i, I would say it comes back to a lot of, of my family 
I've got five kids. I love my kids absolutely to death. They're all um, unique. Um, I'm very, very blessed to have my kids and I'm thankful for it, but I'm also terrified because no matter what I do, I cannot, um, I can give them mentorship. I can give them leadership. I can do everything within my power to help them, but it will be their choice on what they want to do with themselves. My 13 year old, she loves animals. She's a very kind girl. My 11 year old daughter, she's very aggressive with people. She's very, you can't tell her anything. And I look at that and my wife, my wife's got a great perspective on that. She says, your 11 year old is, is passionate and she can use that ability in her life. So no one will be able to talk her into doing the wrong things. Great, honey. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But then again, there's a flip side to that. My, my 11 year old could be so stubborn. She doesn't learn from my life lessons. She won't learn from my wife's life lessons and the people that are around her. And she's going to learn the hard way. My 13 year old, who's as kind as can be, she could be taken advantage of easily by people that are um, wanting to mis misuse her kindness. And um, that's the most scary thing because I can try and transfer everything to my kids. It's in my, it's, in my goals. We're doing our best to instill our values in my children. But once again, it's going to be their decision and not mine. So this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you, Brandon? Um, for me, it's, it's something that's transformative and it disrupts the case of the normal. We talk about uh, it disrupted the life of a lot of people. We talk about um, the invention of the computer it uh, absolutely devastated the lives of a lot of accountants. Um, we look at artificial intelligence. It's on, um, you know, it's on everybody's lips at this point. It's going to disrupt uh, a lot of businesses and a lot of people that thought they were secure. And then um, in those disruptions to the victors go the spoils. And the people that are at those, the forefront of those levels of disruption um, end up typically making quite a bit of money. So if I want to position myself or I want to sit down and really think about it, I want to be somebody that is disrupting the norm in a business. I don't want to be the person that's getting disrupted. I see a lot of people that get disrupted and it just absolutely crushes them. Hmm. And where can we follow you? Where do you um, want us to go? You can get, go check out investmentjoy.com or you can uh, follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, you might see me on chat snapchat soon um we shot a pilot show for that this week and um just pretty much any of the social media platforms everything's at investment joy brandon i've had a great time hope you enjoyed it too and thanks for being on the show well thanks for having me i appreciate it let me know what you think in the comments the bigger we can grow this show for you the bigger and better guests we can get so make sure you do like this video subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on and remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.